Good afternoon and welcome to the Rumi Forum. My name is David Cathell. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute of Turkish Studies here in Washington, D.C. And uh, on behalf of the Rumi Forum, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Stephen Larrabee, uh, who is at the RAND Corporation. He is the Corporate Chair in European Security. And I should also add uh, the co-author of a very good book, which I have used in my classes both at Columbia and at Georgetown. I'm also happy to say that Dr. Larrabee is a uh, graduate of Columbia University and uh, uh, comes from a very fine school. Today, he will be talking about uh, prospects for U.S.-Turkish relations. And uh, I think without further ado, I would turn the floor over. And after a little while, we'll open up the floor for uh, questions and answers. Dr. Larrabee. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here to talk to the Rumi Forum. I've been asked to address the question of prospects for U.S.-Turkish relations. Let me just begin by saying that what I have to say represents my personal views, not the views of Rand or any of its sponsors, just to make that clear. As most of you know, U.S.-Turkish relations have significantly deteriorated over the past few years since 2003. Uh, there's been a growth of anti-American sentiment, a lot of this had to do largely to the impact of the Iraq invasion. Turkey was one of the big losers, as you realize, from this, the invasion. And the invasion had a number of negative consequences for Turkey, resulted in growing instability on Turkey's southern borders. It increased Iran's influence both regionally and in Iraq, and it increased Turkish nationalism and the danger that an independent Kurdish state would emerge or could emerge on Turkey's southern border. And finally, it led to a growth of terror attacks by the Kurdish Workers' Party, the PKK. Particularly, the U.S. unwillingness to support Turkey's effort to combat PKK terrorism led to a sharp deterioration of the relations between the United States and Turkey. Thus, Obama's visit provides an important opportunity put U.S.-Turkish relations on a firmer footing and to improve these relations. First of all, I think that th there is likely to be much greater harmony in Obama's foreign policy uh, than there was with Bush's foreign policy. And this is particularly true in the Middle East. Uh, the withdrawal of, of U.S. forces from Iraq should remove an important irritant in U.S.-Turkish relations. And it will also reduce the U.S. support for the Kurds and diminish Kurdish leverage, I think, over U.S. policy. And it could lead to an important improvement in Turkish relations with the KRG. The KRG, in my view, is more isolated today than in the past. You've witnessed uh, particularly friction, growing friction with the Maliki government particularly over the tribal uh, councils, the creation of tribal councils, the uh, dispute over oil revenues, and also a, a growing fear that Maliki will try to curb the Peshmerga. Many economic incentives also reinforce the political incentives to imp improve relations, it seems to me, between the KRG uh, and Turkey. Turkey represents the most direct and also the most cost-effective route to export oil out of nor northern Iraq to western markets. Turkish investment is also quite substantial in northern Iraq. Turkish concerns, however, although Turkey supports the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Iraq, uh, the Turkish government has a number of concerns. First of all, there's a fear that the precipitous withdrawal could exacerbate instability in Iraq. And secondly, a fear that the remaining weapons, U.S. weapons that are left behind, could fall into the hands of the, uh, the PKK. On Iraq and Syria as well, Obama po policy seems to me more in harmony with uh, AKP policy than the Bush administration's policy was. Turkey has long argued that U.S. policy should try to engage Syria and Iran more, and indeed that was one of the major divergences between U.S. policy and Turkish policy. Turkish policy was 
essentially towards both Iran and towards uh, Syria was oriented towards trying to engage both of these countries, whereas the Bush administration was essentially, or policy was essentially oriented towards uh, trying to either contain Iran or Syria or, or isolate it. Obama, however, wants to engage and open dialogue both with Iran and with Syria. This, therefore, should result in greater harmony between U.S. and Turkish policy and reduce some of the friction that we've seen uh, in the past. Uh, however, I, unlike many observers, I do not think the United States will look to Turkey as a mediator in, this, uh, in relations with Iran or with Syria, not in the way that, not at least as a direct uh, mediator. The U.S. and Obama, I think, during his visit will ask for uh, Turkish support and Turkish advice, but I doubt that he will ask for a direct mediator uh, role. Uh, one co there is one element of continuity, I think, however, in U.S. policy towards Iraq, uh, towards Iran, that uh, will mark both the Bush administration, which is likely to mark uh, the Obama administration as well. And that is that the, the Obama administration, I think, is likely to continue uh, to, resi to ask Turkey to limit its investment in the Ra Iranian oil sector. This is likely to remain to be a source of difference in bilateral relations. On the Arab-Israeli dispute as well, it seems to me here, too, you're likely to see differences in Obama's policy with Bush that may make it easier, uh, greater harmony with Turkish policy. Bush saw Iraq as the key to stability in the Middle East, wrongly in my, in my view, and I think history has shown, recent developments have shown that that was a misperception. And he tended to shun engagement in the Arab-Israeli dispute until the last few months uh, of the administration. This effort in the, at the end of the administration to try, try to broker a peace settlement came, however, to was essentially too little and too late, in my view. Uh, the Netanyahu-Lieberman government uh, could lead, in fact, to greater strains in U.S. relations uh, with uh, Israel. So that's an element that we have to, that deserves to be watched. At the same time, Israel's fear that Obama's effort to reach out to the Muslim world, which was uh, been highlighted by his uh, interview with El al Arabiya at the beginning of his administration. Uh, this effort to, out, to reach out to the Muslim world is likely to uh, also put some strain on the relationship uh, with uh, Israel, it seems to me. And indeed, the most important source of friction in U.S.-Israeli relations could be differences over Iraq. Uh, Israel may press the United States for support for an attack, a military attack on, uh, on Iran. And I think it is unlikely uh, that Obama would support so, such an effort. Afghanistan is also to, uh, likely to be less of a uh, source of friction than it was perhaps in the Bush administration. Uh, Obama is likely to put, in my view, less emphasis on troops uh, from Turkey than on uh, other aspects, such as uh, for many Europeans to help uh, with policing and with re reconstruction. Obama's p policy is also likely to effort more, put more emphasis on uh, diplomacy and try to see, try to uh, see the problems in Afghanistan as closely linked with those in, uh, in Pakistan and indeed take a much broader regional uh, approach than the uh, Bush administration uh, did. All this, it seems to me, is likely to reduce uh, Afghanistan as a point of contention in U.S.-Turkish relations.
On the European front, uh, I think the administration will continue to give strong support uh, for Turkish membership uh, in the European Union, although it may do this less vocally and less openly uh, and less stridently in some ways than the Bush administration did. That, however, I would argue actually could enhance Turkey's uh, chances for uh, membership because I think more quiet diplomacy behind the scenes is likely to be uh, more effective than a confrontational ap approach which uh, is likely not to go down very well uh, with Brussels. Uh, I think Obama will also tr uh, continue to give strong support to Greek-Turkish uh, detente, which has uh, gone on since uh, 1999. However, on Cyprus, I think it's, he is more likely to leave the responsibility for promoting a, a settlement in Cyprus uh, to the UN and to play a more of a supporting role as the United States has uh, in the past rather than uh, a more uh, open and direct uh, role in uh, trying to uh, facilitate a, uh, a settlement of the Cyprus question. However, if the UN talks do begin to show some promise of uh, leading to a settlement, then I could imagine that uh, Obama would perhaps give the talks a greater impetus. But at this point, he has an enormous, he faces a number of enormous challenges, uh, the economic situation being, being one, obviously, the financial situation. Uh, secondly, of course, Afghanistan, Iran, uh, withdrawal from Iraq, Middle East peace process. All these issues are likely to be front and center on his uh, agenda. Therefore, I think Cyprus is likely to be fairly far down on the agenda, and as I suggest, uh, at least initially likely to leave, uh, let the UN take the lead on uh, the question of a Cyprus settlement. One issue that could be somewhat divisive uh, could be the question of relations with Russia. Obama initially is likely to try to engage Russia. I think that's made clear in the letter from uh, Obama to President Medvedev uh, by also uh, Vice President Biden's remarks in uh, at the Munich Security Conference a month ago where he uh, talked about resetting uh, the button uh, on U.S.-Russian uh, relations. But if Russia proves to be unresponsive to the administration's initiatives, uh, the U.S. position could harden. And if it should harden, this uh, could then lead to some strains uh, with Turkey. Uh, Turkey's, uh, Russia is Turkey's uh, number one uh, trade, uh, trading par partner. The relationship with Russia has shown enormous improvement uh, over the last day, mostly in the economic area, but also in the political area. And Turkey's ability to pursue close ties to Moscow could be severely constrained uh, by increased overt co competition between Russia and the West. In other words, Turkey's relationship with Russia will at least in part depend upon the development of Turkey, of Russia's relationship with the United States uh, and the West more uh, broadly. And if that relationship becomes more contentious, uh, this will then have an influence on Turkey's ability to uh, pursue uh, good relations with Russia as well. In the Caucasus more broadly, I would argue that U.S. and Turkish policy uh, objectives and interests largely coincide. Uh, Obama is likely to be particularly uh, supportive of the Turkish-Armenian 
uh, the efforts by Turkey to pursue reconciliation with Armenia. Uh, if this is successful in recent Turkish uh, statements by Turkish officials suggest that Turkey and Armenia are very close to a normalization of, of relations and that one could see some gestures perhaps even before uh, uh, April 24th, uh, but certainly within the next few months the chances are I think very good that there will be some important developments in the relationship between Turkey and Armenia. A normalization of Turkish relations with Armenia would uh, allow Armenia to reduce its economic and political dependence on uh, Moscow. It would also enable Ar Armenia to be integrated more, more into regional energy schemes, and it would remove an important source of instability in the Caucasus. In other words, this is a very important uh, development if, in fact, uh, the reconciliation and the normalization of relations uh, between Turkey and Armenia uh, does, in fact, uh, take place. Therefore, in sum, the relationship between Turkey and uh, the United States on the, ver on the eve of this visit uh, does seem to me to hold the promise of a significant improvement. U.S. and Turkish objectives in a number of areas, particularly the Caucasus and the Middle East, uh, largely overlap. But a lot depends obviously on Obama's handling of the genocide resolution in Congress. The passage of the genocide resolution could derail Obama's effort to repair relations with uh, Turkey. The genocide resolution, of course, has been a perennial sense uh, source of, of friction. Uh, the Bush administration narrowly averted a crisis with Turkey in 2007 only by uh, a last minute push uh, to keep the resolution from coming to the vote. But the issue is obviously far from dead. The uh, Armenian diaspora has been galvanized in some way by their near success in 2007 and also by the fact that the Democrats uh, have a large majority in Congress. Both Obama and Hillary Clinton, as most of you know, supported the resolution in the presidential campaign. But supporting it in a campaign is quite different than supporting it in power. If you look back historically, the, uh, the executive uh, branch of the government has traditionally uh, opposed the resolution. Both George Bush and Bill Clinton supported the resolution uh, when they were not in office, but as soon as they became uh, president, switched their view. It seems to me that this is highly likely to be the case uh, with Obama as well. It is hard for me to imagine that Obama could go to Turkey uh, after the NATO summit and then a few weeks later uh, issue a proclamation uh, which would essentially undercut uh, the all that would be achieved during uh, the visit. Therefore, it's my view that Obama is likely to fudge the issue uh, in some way uh, be, and give priority to <coughs> the strategic uh, <coughs> rationale behind a rapprochement with, with Turkey. Uh, a, if the resolution were to pass, it seems to me that the negative uh, impact on U.S.-Turkish relations could be uh, quite serious. The Erdogan government could, and I'm not saying would, but could come under significant domestic pressure to take some retaliatory action, <coughs> uh, perhaps even uh, 
constraining U.S. access to Interlink. I'm not predicting this, but one cannot exclude that that would happen. Uh, this could affect the U.S. ability to withdraw uh, forces from, uh, from Iraq. <coughs> and secondly, it certainly would have an impact on uh, the transport of men and material to Afghanistan. It would also undercut, most likely, the reconciliation and rapprochement between uh, Armenia and Turkey. Therefore, if one looks at the strategic advantages of maintaining and trying to improve relations with Turkey against uh, the advantages what, uh, of passage of the resolution, it seems to me highly likely that the administration will succeed in finding a way to ensure that the, at least for this year, that the resolution does not come uh, to a vote. That's, I'm a minority, I have to say, uh, in this town. There are a lot of people who think that uh, the resolution uh, will pass, simply because the Democrats have uh, such a large majority uh, in uh, Congress. But as I say, my own view is that the strategic rationale uh, and the desire to improve relations with Turkey, uh, and particularly Turkey's increasingly important role in the Middle East, uh, will impel the administration to find a way uh, to keep uh, the, the resolution from coming to a vote. At the same time, it will be important that Turkey continue the effort that is made over the last few years to address the Armenian issue more directly and more openly. But that is more likely to happen, in my view, if, in fact, the resolution is not uh, passed. Indeed, I think the resolution, among its other uh, negative consequences, would, one of them would be also uh, to undercut and make more difficult the effort that Turkey has been making in the last few years to address the issue. Therefore, you would have three negative, uh, the resolution would, in fact, result in a lose-lose situation. It would uh, impair U.S.-Turkish relations. Uh, it would risk uh, derailing Turkish-Armenian detente, and domestically in Turkey, it would probably uh, lead to not less openness, uh, not more openness, but less uh, openness. So therefore, my hope and conclusion is that uh, it is unlikely to uh, be passed this, this year. Maybe I'll stop there and I'd be glad to answer any questions. Well, thank, thank you very much. Uh, this is a wide-ranging and a very interesting uh, discussion. Um, I'm going to do what I normally do, which is reserve the right to the first question or questions, and then we'll open it up to the floor. And when we do open it up, if you will uh, be so kind as to identify yourself in whatever affiliation, academic or otherwise you might have. Um, my, my questions are, are, are twofold. Um, one is, you mentioned that the, um, that the United States is, is probably fairly loath to um, allow Turkey to act as a moderator, but in particular... Mediator. Oh, okay, mediator. Um, in particular, uh, of interest to me is, is what is going on in the Caucasus and Armenia and Azerbaijan, um, and clearly the U.S. has something to bring to the table there but also something to gain from uh, a, a more settled relations in, in, the, uh, in the Caucasus. Uh, certainly if uh, Nagorno-Karabakh can be resolved, uh, that has implications for uh, energy coming out of, or gas coming out of Turkmenistan, um, as well as, as lessening of tensions in the, in, the, in the Caucasus. 
in, in this capacity, though, do you think that um, Turkey can play uh, a, a, part, a role of a party at the table, or by definition, uh, when it comes to U.S.-Russian relations, uh, they will be uh, in a role in this area of being a mediator? Uh, or is it sort of a tripartite, do you, do you see that as being a tripartite uh, situation? And the second is, is just a more general question, and that is, what would you suggest going forward um, in terms of a way of building a foundation where Turkish-American relations are not held hostage to periodic, particularist political agenda, um, such as the, the issue of the, um, the, the genocide resolution? Let me start with the second, uh, because I th think it's on everybody's mind. <sighs> It's unfortunate, but the U.S. political system is what it is, and there, in some cases, and therefore, domestic lobbies do play an important role, and they're going to continue to play an important role. And this issue is not going to go away. And at some point, one of these resolutions might pass. I think Turkey also has to recognize that this is part of the way the U.S. system works. It does not reflect the view of the uh, administration, and that it should take a more relaxed view towards, towards this issue. The best thing that they could do to undercut it would be to continue the degree of, and increase the degree of openness that with which the issue has been addressed. Uh, and also to continue with the rapprochement uh, and reconciliation with Armenia. Because those are the things that are most important. This resolution will do nothing to improve the life of the average Armenian. Indeed, it's likely, if passed, to lead to uh, a less, uh, if, it, if it passes, it, it's likely uh, to, to halt, as I said, uh, or derail the rapprochement uh, between Turkey and uh, Armenia. It will make it less likely that the border will be opened. If the border is opened, it would have a very important economic impact uh, on Armenia, and if the re reconciliation goes for forward, as I said, it will enable uh, Armenia to reduce its political and economic dependence uh, on Russia, and it will enable Armenia to be integrated into some of the energy schemes. All these things could be endangered by the uh, passage of, uh, of the resolution. But, as I said, Turkey also has to, as part of a process of maturity, recognize that this should not be allowed to undercut the fundamentals of which are at stake in the U.S.-Turkish re relationship. I think that a more relaxed attitude towards this. This should not become the litmus test, as it does each year, of U.S.-Turkish relations. U.S.-Turkish relations are, fa are based on much broader interests, which both nations uh, share, and much more important uh, interests. So I just sort of say it, it, it would be good if you could take somewhat of a relaxed, uh, more relaxed uh, attitude towards this, recognizing that uh, the system of the domestic lobbies uh, have uh, sometimes an, uh, a degree of influence uh, that is out of proportion to their actual size. But you know, even if this is a pass, this is not a binding resol resolution, uh, and the best way to defang it in the, the future, as I said, is to address this issue 
uh, do what Erdogan has suggested, which I think is right to continue to try to uh, uh, put together a historical commission, as he has suggested, and continue to show that Turkey is willing to address this issue. That will have more effect on undercutting the, uh, the impact of the resolution uh, than anything else other than the reconciliation between Turkey and Ar Ar Armenia. Now, the, the first question related to the question of the Caucasus. I think Turkey is playing an ex exceedingly important role in the Caucasus. I think, as I said, U.S. and Turkish um, interests and policy largely overlap. I don't see Turkey playing a role as a mediator between the U.S. and Russia. The United States doesn't really need a mediator there. But I do see uh, Turkey even being out in front in the Caucasus in terms of promoting uh, security and stability there. And I think the stability platform obviously is an important example. It came comes at a time when Russia is not too interested in stability in, uh, in the Caucasus. But it provides a framework uh, which over time could lead to uh, improvements. And I, uh, I think Turkey's role there is more, probably more important in many ways, or at least as important as the U.S. role. But I don't see Turkey as a mediator. Um, but I do see it, as I said, as actually being the, maybe the lead player uh, in the Caucasus. Uh, of course, if the United States relationship with uh, Russia were to improve significantly, this also could uh, lead to some improvement in the Caucasus. But the fact of the matter is that Russia regards the Caucasus, the Black Sea area, and most of the post-Soviet space uh, as part of their sphere of influence. And this is uh, basically what they would like to see is a Western and U.S. de facto, if not de jure, recognition of their sphere of influence. This is unlikely to take place. It would be a rejection and repudiation of U.S. policy since the end of World War II and a repudiation essentially of the Helsinki agreements. What we, we don't want to see more Yaltas or more dividing lines in uh, the post-Soviet space. And uh, what we want to see uh, is fewer dividing lines. So therefore, uh, it is unlikely to that Russia will succeed uh, in its objective to get the West and the United States, in particular, to accept a, a sphere, uh, a sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, sir. Well Pace, no affiliation. Uh, just wanted to uh, ask you a question about the uh, the new Assistant Secretary of State for Europe, mm -hmm. uh, Philip Gordon. That, uh, as you know, is a Turkey expert and has written a book about Turkey just right. last year. Uh, what do you think of the idea he proposed in that book of a uh, grand bargain between Turkey and the Kurds, both within Turkey and in northern Iraq? Uh, I don't know exactly what the grand bargain uh, entailed, uh, therefore it's hard for me to make a comment on it directly, but I assume that in some way it uh, involved an improvement of relations between uh, Turkey and uh, the KRG, uh, and in return, I suppose, for some uh, economic continued economic support support from investment and trade for, from Turkey. I mean, what I think you've seen uh, 
is in fact a shift in uh, Turkish policy towards greater engagement recently with the KRG. Uh, one of the main obstacles to that in the past had been the uh, opposition of the Turkish military. That seems to have been largely uh, overcome now. And in the recent months, you've seen increasing contacts between uh, Turkey and uh, the KRG. The issue, of course, the real issue there is whether Barzani is willing to crack down on the PKK. And so far, he really has not, until very recently, shown any indication whatsoever of being willing to do that. Uh, so if there's going to be an improvement, uh, a serious improvement of relations with the KRG, then that will have to be uh, overcome. Now there's, as you know, some talk recently that there, there may be he may be willing to do more than he has in the past, but the proof uh, of the pudding will be in the eating, and we have to see whether, in fact, that really does uh, prove to be the case. He, so far, he's been uh, notably unwilling to take the steps that would make a real intensification of relations uh, between Turkey and the KRG possible. I would like to, if I may, turn to the Turkish, Armenian, and United States triangle. As you mentioned, that Turkey should understand the, the difference, divergence, uh, political, internal, and external uh, divergence <coughs> of opinion between the executive and the uh, uh, and the legislative power in the United States, and you just mentioned that Turkey should be more understanding of these differences, therefore, etc., etc., etc. It would be very difficult to teach the average Turk the intricacies of the domestic policies in the United States. What will happen is that the big headlines will be that Americans recognize they are. Armenian uh, Turkish atrocities, or uh, whatever the word is, uh, genocide, etc. So et even you have a problem. Imagine what problem Obama is going to have. <laughs> now, uh, Switzerland recognized it, Denmark recognized it, France did. But those countries are not the United States. Mm. The United States is much more important to, to Turkey, and Turkey is much more important to the United States than Switzerland is to Turkey or Turkey to Switzerland. Now, about six months ago, I was in uh, Armenia, and I had the chance to talk to a number of high-level politicians, as well as men in the street. Both groups very categorically mentioned that they had no problems with Turkey. The problems were emanating from the diaspora Armenians, which are the third generation mm. or the fourth generation. Now, would that be wiser for the United States yes. to use influence on Armenia to quiet down the diaspora guys rather than trying to teach the Turks the difference between the executive and legislative power of the United States? Well, I mean, your basic point I would accept. It would, the problem is the diaspora and not necessarily Armenia itself. It's not entirely clear to me that, quite frankly, the Armenian government, how much influence it has over the diaspora. The interests of the it's Armenian clear. government and the interests of the diaspora do not necessarily coincide. Uh, and therefore, just as the U.S. government uh, actually doesn't have too much influence over, over it, uh, the Armenian government has more, but still I don't think that they can completely con control it. But the answer, the basic answer to your question is, yes, one should try to find a way uh, to influence the diaspora in a way that would make it easier for Turkey and Armenia to continue with the rapprochement. I don't expect in any way that uh, the average Turk will 
uh, understand the difference between the executive and the legislative. What I am saying, though, is that Turkey's ability and willingness to confront this issue, show more openness on it, uh, do the things, continue to do and increase the efforts that it's made in recent years, can have an effect on how uh, on the legislative process and will make it easier for the executive branch of the government to diffuse this uh, this issue so Turkey has a, Turkey can play a role in this and the can, uh, the current rapprochement and or effort at reconciliation is extremely important in this uh, uh, in this sense if in fact there something uh, takes place in the next month or so that will have an, an important effect on the mood in Congress as well as on obviously US policy uh, itself so these issues are all interconnected in a certain way. No one expects uh, Turkey to Turkish citizens to know the intricacies of the difference between uh, the legislative and the executive branch. But as I said, a continued openness and willingness of Turkey to address this issue uh, will have an, an effect on the legislative process, and that's the important point. Yes, ma'am. My name is Inji Bowman. I'm uh, from the International Committee for Crimea, but I'm speaking as a Turkish American. Mm -hmm. um, so far, we have not heard anything about the uh, Turkish victims of the Ar Armenian atrocities in Turkey at the turn of the uh, 20th century. And I once, well, there are thousands and probably millions of Turkish citizens whose ancestors were killed by, uh, by Armenians. And I once worked uh, with a Turkish physician in Houston who had lost 42 members of his family to the Armenian atrocities in Eastern Anatolia. So what I'm saying is that Turkish government, people blame Turkish government, but Turkish government is not separate from the Turkish people. And I don't believe that uh, Turkish government could ever accept this because people would really, the Turkish people would really re maybe rebel. I mean, I also attended two meetings in Istanbul about this issue, emotions run very high. Turks feel very strongly about this. And we don't hear anything about how the Turkish people feel about this. Well, I think that it's fairly well known to specialists who work on this uh, issue and to uh, government officials in the United States that the Turkish people do feel very strongly about this. but. It is also, I think, fair to say that there, there is not clarity in exactly what happened in 1915. There were atrocities on both sides, although it seems to me the evidence suggests that there were more uh, done to the Armenians than vice versa. But this is an issue that should be left to the historians to clarify. It cannot be regulated through the legislative uh, process. Uh, therefore, what the United States and Turkey and, and Armenia <coughs> should be doing, it seems to me, is trying to put together, as Turkey is there to want to suggest, a historical commission that it can, in fact, in fact investigate this uh, and try to come to, uh, to some judgment. Now, if that judgment, if the historical record uh, should somehow uh, show that there were, that in fact the Ottoman authorities uh, did carry out 
a number of atrocities, then you will have to deal with that just as the United States has had to deal with the fact uh, that we committed a lot of crimes against Indians. Now, when I was growing up, I grew up in the 50s where the Indians were always portrayed as the bad guys. And, you know, there were no good Indians. And there was a famous saying, the best uh, engine is a dead engine. I engine being a word for Indians. That was the mentality that I grew up with until the 60s when a different um, portrayal of the Indians began to uh, be, be made, both in films and historical record and so forth. And the American people had to learn that, in fact, what I had learned as a child was, in fact, not true. We did a lot of things that we said we didn't do. And I'm not saying this will be the case in Turkey, but if it is, you too will have to go through a process of accepting the truth. But right now, we don't know what that truth is because um, it, it, isn't, um, it hasn't been established and there's too much uh, unclarity and so forth. So the, the basic thing is to try to get a better understanding historically of what happened, and that's why I think what Erdogan has proposed, uh, and then he has proposed first that it would be done um, Armenia and Turkey, but then he later said other historians could from other countries. So that seems to me the best way and the starting point for, uh, for this, but we cannot let uh, the <coughs> This is not something that can be legislated. It can only yeah. come come through through a historical pro process. That's what we have to <laughs> if, if I could just weigh in very briefly here, uh, I'd just like to make two quick points. The first is that everybody should be aware that the Armenians lost their historical homeland, and that is a, a very difficult, terrible burden to bear. The second point is that all the nations, I think it's, I can't remember, it's 49 nations in the OSCE or whatever the number is, all agreed to, including Turkey, to look at this issue and let the chips fall where they may. The only nation that did not agree was Armenia. So it's a complicated issue, but hopefully, you know, there will be a solution and, and people will come together on this. And I think, I, let me just add that the reconciliation process itself will make it easier to do that once the there's been a kind of political break, uh, breakthrough. Right. I think it'll be easier to address this issue uh, as well. Uh, so that that can contribute uh, to the to that. Absolutely. Same same cooking, same family ideas, very similar. Yes, sir. That's right. <coughs> Thank you. Um, uh, Abraham Avidor uh, doing consulting work for the American Turkish Council. And my question is, in what way the U.S. can uh, facilitate or help uh, resolve the uh, Cyprus issue that Turkey is involved in, and also in what way the U.S. can assist Turkey become a member of the EU? Right now, it seems like it's, it's been a perpetual candidate with not much progress. Thank you. First, on the EU, uh, I mean, Turk uh, the United States can't do too much to help Turkey. It can support, as it has traditionally and will continue to do, Turkish membership. But this is uh, ultimately a, a decision that will have to be made by the European Union. Now, I think, first of all, you have to accept the fact that the Erdogan government has done more than any other government to uh, try to facilitate Turkey's entry into the EU. But you also have to accept that since 2005, the domestic reform process has slowed down. And w one needs to, th th I mean, there are a number of reasons for this. Obviously, there's been some hardening of the EU attitude, which has then been reflected in Turkey in disenchantment with uh, the EU and therefore the government has felt under less pressure in some ways uh, to
to move, move us forward uh, with the do domestic reform as it might have done otherwise. And then you have to take into consideration at the same time that the party was fighting for its life for a while and so forth. But now that, that period is over and therefore it will be incumbent upon Turkey to reinvigorate uh, the reform process. And the United States role there can be to encourage Turkey to do that uh, and to continue to support its membership, which I think it, think it will do. Um, on Cyprus, again, this is an, what's changed when is the fact that in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, the U.S. had a major ro role to play in the Cyprus issue. But now the Cyprus issue is essentially an issue between the EU uh, and Turkey. The U.S. role in some way has been, uh, quite frankly, marginalized uh, because it's not uh, the United States that's holding up uh, progress to a certain extent, but uh, it is, in fact, so entangled with, uh, with Turkey's accession to the EU, with Cyprus' role in, in membership in the EU, uh, and there, the, the United States has really limited uh, leverage. It can, behind the scenes, try to encourage the EU to do certain things, but itself, uh, its, its role is actually limited. And that's why, in the past, if you look at this, uh, the Cyprus issue has been an issue on which the United States has uh, stumbled t t badly uh, a number of times, particularly in 63, 64, and uh, in 1974. Uh, and in part, in each time it has ended up uh, either having re a de sharp deterioration of relations with one side or in, some, in, bo in many cases uh, with both sides. And therefore, since essentially 1974, the U.S. has withdrawn a little bit from the Cyprus issue, has not played the lead role, but has been supportive in the U.N. process. And I think, as I said, given all the major challenges and pressing problems on Obama's plate, uh, he's likely to continue to give, have play a supportive role, but not necessarily take take the lead unless and until there are some signs that there's a real likelihood of a breakthrough. And if that were to sh happen, then I think he would more likely throw the U.S. weight into the breach and try to get there. But it is not an issue on which the U.S. has the most leverage. It is the EU and it's within the framework of the EU that this will have to be you know, ultimately resolved. Got time for one more question. Yes. Maybe two. We talked about the resolution, but I did not hear you say anything about what Obama is going to do on the 24th. Going to if I knew, I, 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 I can tell you what I think he'll do, but I can't, like everyone else, I'm guessing. But my calculation is it's very hard for me to imagine him going to Turkey and then two weeks later uh, making a major pronouncement on, ge on genocide and using the G word. <laughs> now, I may be wrong, but I... I cannot see that the, I cannot believe the administration hasn't thought this through. And therefore, I'm, it strikes me that it's likely that he will make a major statement, but will avoid using the word uh, genocide. Now against that argument is, of course, the fact that he said he would, uh, he would support the resolution 
in uh, the campaign, and the, the, the domestic part of the White House will obviously be arguing very strongly that he made this commitment and that he has to uh, abide by it. And the foreign policy side of the White House, which is, this is, this is always the way it is, will say, look, the strategic arguments, the strategic factors outweigh uh, the domestic fa factors here. And you know, we will see who, which side wins. But my guess is that he will make a strong statement, but avoid using the word uh, genocide. But you know, no, no one can can say for for certain, and this happens every year. And, but my, to my recollection, the only president that actually used the word genocide, I think, was Ronald Reagan. The others have uh, avoided using the word uh, uh, genocide. But all of this has become, as I tried to suggest, a highly overly politicized issue. Uh, the real fact is that this should not become a litmus test of U.S.-Turkish relations. There are too many other deeper and more fundamental interests that the two sides uh, share, and it would be, whether he uses the word genocide or not, it would be, in my view, ill-considered and counterproductive to allow this issue to obscure these more fundamental and basic interests that tie the two countries together. Thank you. Hakan, last question. Uh, I have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, really <laughs> folks, Setsa Foundation. Uh, thank you so much. Sorry. For I'm sorry, which foundation? Setsa. Oh, yes. Right. Um, so my question is, is regarding some pre-existing mechanisms for dialogue. On the Turkish side, we have in Parliament the um, U.S., Turkey, French, and Caucus. Uh, and that are following several uh, delegations to, to Washington in the last several months. And on the U.S. side, in Congress, we have the uh, Turkey Caucus, headed by Congressman Wexler, and also the Congressional Study Group on Turkey. Uh, what can be done, in, in your opinion, to, uh, to increase the level of engagement between these two pre-existing mechanisms for dialogue? There must be some, some greater potential to utilize these. Thank you. Well, I think one of the uh, important things would be a greater interaction between Turkish members of the National Grand National Assembly and uh, Congress. In other words, greater c congressional uh, interaction. I think on both sides it would be uh, useful. Uh, I think it's important that more congressmen understand what's happening in Turkey, what's going on, also, even on the, the, the genocide resolution, I mean, the fact of the matter is that most congressmen who will vote either for or against this have very little knowledge of what really happened, let alone how difficult it is to really find the truth in the first place. Uh, they are voting on it because one of their colleagues asked them to <coughs> vote on it, uh, or because they have particular constituents in their uh, district and so forth, or because the president asked them to vote for or against it, uh, but they don't really know and they don't really have a, a very good knowledge in many cases of uh, Turkey, let alone a complicated issue. So the greater interaction between parliamentarians uh, certainly would be uh, important, and it's uh, it's uh, significant in this regard that that uh, senators like McCain, uh, who actually oppose the resolution, have spent a lot of time in Turkey and have uh, a kind of broad understanding of Turkey's importance and uh, and significance. So I would say the most important thing that I can think of would be uh, to increase the interaction between par parliamentarians uh, as well as some of the groups that you, you mentioned. Thank you, David. Uh, Hakan Taşçı from Tuscon. 
it will be a kind of domestic issue for Turkey, but uh, I would like to hear more about your impressions about what's going on in Turkey. Uh, uh, there's a court court case going on in Turkey called Ergenekon. Mm. The second indictment came two days ago, maybe, and uh, more than hundred people, including four-star generals, are uh, are in the court are arrested just because they they tried to make a couple of coups, at least three. Just uh, because. Mm. <laughs> 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 you make it sound as if it's a minor. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Anyway, but there's a case going on there, and then I would like to get your impression how this case is seen from here. I think, you know, that with the exception of myself and 10 other people, uh, probably most people are not following it uh, here. This re your question reminds me of the film uh, Charlie Wilson's War, if any of you saw it, where uh, Seymour Hoffman comes in playing the CIA uh, representative and Charlie Wilson asks him, what's going on in Afghanistan? Why aren't we doing more? And uh, Seymour Hoffman says, uh, well, we're working on it. And Charlie Wilson says, who's we? Oh, me and two other guys. <laughs> right. So this is sort of like asking me, me you know, there are probably a half dozen people, uh, Phil Gordon being one of them, uh, uh, or 10 or 12 people who are aware of this, but this is not an issue that, uh, you know, most Americans are familiar with. And those who are familiar with it are having a hard time, like <laughs> myself, are having a very hard time <laughs> understanding what really uh, happened. And there have been, my impression is that, uh, you know, there have been some, where there's smoke, there's probably fire, but it's, it's hard to really tell what has, uh, has actually uh, been going on. And in some cases, I think the way that it has been handled uh, has not helped uh, the case uh, of trying to find out what's what's really uh, behind all this. I don't, in saying this, I don't want to in any way leave the impression that I don't think this is serious. I think it's very serious. And I think it does get to raise questions about the role of the deep state. But at the same time, it's, it's very hard for somebody from the outside to understand directly wh wh what has been going on. Hopefully there'll be more clarity in the coming months and years. Hopefully. Inshallah. <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs> Dr. Larrabee, thank you very much. This has been a very interesting uh, and enlightening thank discussion. You. Thank you so much.